Open up uh, Acts to Acts 12, 25 with me as we finish the last verse of Acts chapter 12 and then on into chapter 13. We actually had planned Josh's uh, ordination initially for last week and some sickness kept us from being able to do it then. And so it got pushed forward to this week and I'm thankful because it really lands on a portion of scripture that is so fitting for such an occasion. Uh, here we find the Lord ordaining and setting apart the Apostle Paul and Barnabas for their very first missionary journey. And we see them sent forth under the anointing ministry of God's Holy Spirit. So as you may very well know, uh, the latter part of the book of Acts, beginning in chapter 13 and all the way up through chapter 28, details uh, the Apostle Paul's four missionary journeys. On that first missionary journey, as Barnabas with him, the next two, Silas and, and Timothy. And then on the very last one is essentially a missionary journey that takes place while he's in chains and being drugged about by the Roman government from place to place until he lands in Caesar's lap. And so the Lord would greatly use the Apostle Paul. But actually, we have humble beginnings. And just because we know the end of the story and we understand all that the Lord did with Apostle Paul, we can sometimes uh, forget where he came from and how this whole thing initially happened. In fact, my subtitle for today's mes message, uh, Worshiper Sent, uh, God Did Something Amazing. And what we really find here is a ragtag group of no-namers that have not set out to save the world, have not set out to change the world, but drew just a group of godly men, not the apostles, just a group of godly no-namers gathered for worship in the Roman city of Antioch. And the Holy Spirit latches on to these guys and sends them out to this great work that we can now look back and marvel at. But it began not by them seeking the Lord's face for mission and ministry, but simply for fellowship and conformity to him. And so we consider this great beginning of a great work of God with several men seated at the feet of the Savior. Let's pray and jump into this text this morning. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for you and thankful for this passage of Scripture that we embark on now, not just this morning, but in the weeks ahead, to consider these great missionary endeavors, which were your idea, accomplished through men whom you called, and Lord, we just pray that we'd be reminded of the availability that your spirit uh, has, is to uh, the availability of your spirit to us. And Lord, we, we want to be those that are available to your Holy Spirit. We want to be worshipers. Uh, Lord, and whether you send us far or near, that's your, your time, your prerogative. But Lord, first and foremost, we want to seek you for you. And we want to sit at your feet, drawing near to you and being changed by you. So Lord, would you teach us this morning, we pray, by your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as I mentioned, we all look at the very first missionary journey of the Apostle Paul this morning. But it's, we won't look at the trip in its entirety, really what we look at is the introduction to that trip and how they were called to that trip. And so we'll consider the five W's and an H of this call to the missionary uh, service, the, the world's first missionary trip, you could say. Uh, the five W's and an H, a great way to an examine event and really uh, to become familiar with it. The who, what, where, when, why, and then, of course, the how of this missionary calling of the Apostle Paul. 
So excited to dig in and consider what the Lord did. Oh, let's begin with the where. It's a logical spot to start. And we actually back up into chapter 25 of, of chapter or verse 25 of chapter 12, to begin this portion of Scripture and uh, this, this whole narrative. Verse 20, and let me read uh, verse uh, 25 of chapter 12, all the way up through verse 3 then of chapter 13. Get our, here within these verses, we'll get our where, our who, and our, our when, and a little bit of the what and some of the how, and we'll leave the why for last. Uh, take them out of order a little bit. Here we are in verse 25. Uh, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry, and they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. Now, in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, uh, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. And so as we dig into this text and we consider these five W's and an H, let's consider first the, the where of it. We have several locations mentioned already. The first of which is Jerusalem in verse 25. It says Paul and, and or Barnabas and Saul were returning from Jerusalem. So they, had, remember, they had already been up in Antioch and now they had gone down to Jerusalem to provide funds for the Christians in Jerusalem who were hurting during a famine. And so we have Jerusalem mentioned. Uh, then we have in verse 13, Antioch mentioned. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, this was uh, the, the first church planted in the country of Turkey, still in so south uh, eastern Turkey today, along the Mediterranean Sea, uh, this church in Antioch. And, and uh, then later on, we'll, we'll, uh, and then we find the location of some of the men, and then later on, they'll go down to Cyprus, uh, the, uh, the country of, uh, which is called the Republic of Cyprus today, still there, a third largest uh, a country, island country in, in the Mediterranean. Uh, but, but really, the two spots for us to really consider in the where are Jerusalem and then Antioch, and specifically Antioch, for that's where this ministry will be sent out. Uh, I believe it's important for us to consider the where of it because first off, we just realized that the first missionary journey sent out was not from the esteemed and prestigious Jerusalem. It was not from this place that, of course, the, the, maybe the center of Jewish worship, the place that the Lord had planted his name, that would be a logical place. Pla place for the Lord to send out. No, rather it was Antioch. Now certainly Antioch was strategic. Right there on the Mediterranean Sea coast, it was an easy place to go out and then return to. And I know the Lord had his strategery there. But in one way you could say it could have been any place. And as I wonder if Paul and Barnabas, or Barnabas and Saul, as their names are mentioned still, may not have been tempted to hang out around Jerusalem a little longer than needed. After all, that's where all the hubbub was. And that's where all the big namers were. And that was the place of the Lord's glory. That was the city of the great king, right? That was Jerusalem. And maybe they were tempted to hang out there a little longer, but I love it how they returned to this place, a lesser known place a lesser esteemed place, and it was from there that the Lord launched them. We can be tempted to think that location is necessary for the Lord to work. What does a business say? Location, location, location. I remember when my wife and I first moved to Bozeman, Montana, we were so familiar with the Calvary Chapel movement in Southern California. The Calvary Chapel movement in Southern California just had exploded through the years, of course, with pa Pastor Chuck Smith and so many of the other large Calvary pastors like, like Greg Laurie or, 
or Damien Kyle and a lot of these guys down there, K-Wave, and we would go out street witnessing and we could be on an Oceanside Pier and, and, and talking to a guy and I don't care how far gone he seemed. He'd say, oh yeah, I got a brother or a sister or a cousin, a neighbor that goes to a Calvary Chapel. We'd just have to drop the name and people are immediately familiar. Then we move up to Bozeman and we thought we would have at least an inn in the door that we were coming alongside a Calvary Chapel. And the people, oh, you're the Calvary guys. Oh, so thankful there's a Calvary here. Uh, none of that. I remember saying, they go, people would ask, where do you go to church? Just talking to some unbeliever. And I would say Calvary Chapel. They had never even heard of it. They'd say, uh, Calgary Chapel? And I'm like, no, we're not from Canada. And then they, they'd say, uh, oh, the, the cavalry. I'm like, no, no hitching posts here. Like, this is Calvary Chapel. So really, it was, we didn't even have like we didn't, square one. If anything, it was just kind of working against us. No name grew. They realize it's not so much about location as it is devotion to the Lord. And what we find here is the Lord would use a group of men who may have been in a strange place, although not strange to the Lord. He had chosen Antioch for a certain purpose. But they weren't worried about relocating. They were only concerned with seeking the face of Christ. And so we've all been around people, and maybe it's been you at times, who feel the need to change some external thing for the sake of a deeper walk with Christ or maybe a more blessed life, even in the things such as, as family and, and overall health and well-being, where we might want to switch jobs or states or marriages, sadly. And we realize we bring the problem with us. Because we're the problem. And the Lord just says, it doesn't, you don't have to switch anything about your life. Other than your devotion. Just like that song, we, that last song that we sang this morning. About the cares of the world creeping in. And I, maybe I just what I need is to be still. And sit at the feet of the Savior. To know he is God. And we, so that's where this whole thing took place. The Lord used this place. Could be any place the Lord sends from. But then we consider the who. Now we've, even just the way that Barnabas and Saul's name first come, that's important to us as we begin to list, it, list the group of guys that are mentioned here. We have Barnabas, Saul, and Mark, all in verse 25. And then in chapter 13, again, Barnabas and Saul are both mentioned as bookends, but we also find a man named Simeon, Lucius, and Menaean here. So we have, uh, five, we have six guys mentioned, and who are they? And like I said, just even the way Barnabas and Saul are mentioned would remind us of this, that Saul was not Paul yet. His name is still Saul. He'll actually get his name changed in chapter 13 with no commentary. It just happens. And, but from this point, it's just Barnabas and Saul because Barnabas is the more significant of these two at this point in history. And Barnabas is not an apostle, although he's called an apostle later on more in the strategic sense of one being sent by the Lord, not so much as the title or the foundation of the church. But he was an encourager. So we begin with Barnabas, who's the most familiar man on this list at this point. And he was the son of encouragement. He gave gifts, financial gifts to the church earlier. He's the one that went after and sought after Saul zealously to bring him alongside. Everybody loved Barnabas because he was a kind, loving, generous fellow. But other than that, he's a no-namer. And I just consider Barnabas as just one who loved the Lord, was changed by the Lord, and just wanted to do good and just wanted to serve. And so he's, he's one of the pillars of this church. There's also Saul, who at this point is not called Paul, and certainly not the Apostle Paul. And although he's been saved for 14 years, nobody wants anything to do with him. He, they still remember him as the zealous Pharisee who sought to destroy the church, imprison, and even kill Christians, and except Barnabas called him alongside. And so Saul, Saul is still one who is a, a man deeply thankful for his own salvation and just wants to love and serve the Lord and doesn't have major dreams or, uh, or, or major backing at this point, any of that. Then we find a man in chapter 13, verse 1, at, at the church that was at Antioch. We, 
we see there's a group of prophets and teachers. So these were the leaders. They were prophets, not just speaking of predictive future events, uh, but also powerfully and by the Spirit, speaking forth the truth of God's word. Both would have been included within that. And then a teaching gift that was given to them uh, to be able to edify the body of Christ. So there's, they're leaders within the church, prophets and teachers. And then some of them are, of course, Barnabas mentioned again, but then you also have Simeon, who was called Niger, or literally Simeon, who was called black man, is what Niger means, uh, a dark-complected man. Uh, and uh, some have thought, and, and quite possibly so, I believe so, that this Simeon is actually Simon of Cyrene, who was from northern Africa, the same Simon that carried the Lord's cross on the night of his suffering or the morning of his suffering. And uh, because we also know that there were men from Cyrene, that was, and Cyprus, not only the island country, but Cyrene, the North Africa country, that planted the church initially in Antioch. In fact, the next man after Simon is called Lucius of Cyrene, probably not to be uh, associated with Dr. Luke, who's writing Acts, uh, but another man from Cyrene or from northern Africa, uh, uh, then along with a man named Manaean, who was brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. And so Manaean would have been Idumean. We had Jews here. We had Idumeans here. We had North Africans here. It was a racially diverse group of people. I love it. No namers. And Manaean is actually especially intriguing because Manaean, it says he was brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. What does that mean? It was customary uh, in this time for boys that were the same age as the young princes who were brought up in the palace to be brought with them and to be raised alongside them really as a friend. And Menaean had been brought into palace life to be raised alongside Herod the Tetrarch, which Herod was that. Same as Herod Antipas, this Herod that was brought up with Menaean, they were boy, boyhood friends enjoying all the same privileges of palace life, this Herod would grow up to be the one who would have John the Baptist murdered. Uh, be, Jesus would call a fox, and then Jesus would later stand trial before him. It's interesting that Manaean's there. Much like Moses, who, rejected, who grew up the brother of Pharaoh's son, rejected all of the, the privileges and Blessings of the world in palace life, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. And Manan, what did he see growing up? Hanging out in the palace with this wicked Herod, and then watching Jesus die and then rise again. And Manan was one who said, This is truth, and that's wickedness. And I want to follow this. And so there's just this group. I, 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 if, I, if I could just sum up the group of men, the, the who. I would say these were men that were deeply appreciative of the gospel of grace in their own lives. Men that had been saved from various backgrounds and troubles. Some of them terribly sinful men. Others, others excluded men, marginalized men. And they're just gathered together to worship the Lord and the Lord will send them out. Now we have a real problem as humans to think too much of the people around us and to think too little of the people around us as well, let's be honest. <laughs> but it's very easy for us to put people up on pedestals, right? Especially after they've experienced a season of success. Put them on a pedestal, I'll never be able to reach that. But we have to realize the scripture talks about many people who have done great things for the Lord and been used wonderfully by the Lord came from very humble beginnings. And I just struck, I think I actually laughed out loud when I was recently reading through First Chronicles, a passage I've read many times, about David's calling. And just how the Lord said these two things to David in this familiar passage. Uh, the Lord said to David, David, I took you from following the sheep. I like that. <laughs> Not leading the sheep. There was David out in the wilderness following the sheep. I took you from following the sheep to be a leader over my people. And then he said, and then David, I gave you a name like the, great na like the name of the great men on the earth. David was not one of the great men on the earth. David was just following the sheep out there in the wilderness. And then the Lord called him away from that and made him a great name. 
In fact, it's very easy for us to put the Apostle Paul up on a pedestal. And he was quick to remind us, I'm the chief of sinners. I'm not even worthy to be a saint. And yeah, maybe I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet yeah, not I, yet yeah, not I, but the grace of God that was within me. And so where did this all happen? It could have been anywhere. Who was called? Those deeply changed by the grace of God. And then when were they called? When were they called? Well, I love the scripture. It tells us two things. When? Uh, well, outside of these two things, we know historically that, that uh, it's about 14 years after Saul's conversion. Uh, and so we're somewhere between 47 A.D. and maybe 50 A.D. at the start of the first missionary journey. Somewhere right in that window. However, as far as the text goes, when were they called? Verse 25, it tells us when they had fulfilled their ministry. That's when they were called. That's one of the things. And then secondly, when were they called? Verse 2 answers the question for us. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted. So they were called when they were doing these two things. One, when they were being faithful in the small things. And then secondly, when they were simply worshiping the Lord and fasting. That's when the Lord got a hold of them. I love the fact that they were just fulfilling their ministry. What ministry was that in verse 25? It was simply bringing funds that had been collected from Antioch down to supply the needs of the church and in, in Jerusalem. They were essentially buying and bringing groceries to those that were hungry. That's right where they were at. That's when the Lord called them. When they were being faithful in the small things, what did Jesus say in Matthew 25, 21? You were faithful over a few things, right there in the center of the verse, and I will make you ruler over many things. Oh, how the Lord loves to find us faithful in the small things. I'll never forget the day when, uh, filled with uh, much anxiety and consternation about the future, where we were going to live and how I was going to provide for my, my bride, my wife-to-be here in a couple of months when we were getting married, that I took Cheryl's hand. We walked into a, it was on a Saturday. We walked into a Bible college classroom. We just sat down and we came up with a mission statement for our lives that is, the Lord's never relinquished. And we just said, Lord, we don't know where we're going to go, what we're going to do. But we have things to do that you've placed in our lap presently. And Lord, help us just to be faithful with that and to trust you for the future. Uh, I was discipling a couple of men. Cheryl was discipling some girls in the youth group where we were serving as, as helpers. I worked and she worked. And we said, Lord, just help us to be faithful with what's before you, before us right now. And we'll trust you for the big picture and for the future. And the Lord's always been faithful. Hey, listen to this. The Lord called these men not when they were frustrated with everything going on around them, but when they were faithful with what was directly before them. And the Lord, too, will call those today, not those that are frustrated with the world around, but faithful with what is before. And so I urge you, to simply do what the Lord has called you to. He'll take care of the rest. Well, not only were they faithful in the small things, but they were also uh, deeply worshipful and dedicated men unto the service of the Lord. Their location didn't need to change. Their devotion to the Lord was rich. Uh, they didn't need to be the great people of the earth, the weak and the foolish. Uh, just the Lord would use their simple heart. It was a heart of worship. So when were they called? Verse 2 tells us, and this is really the heart of the text, why the Holy Spirit puts this text in here for us. It simply says, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, now separate to me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. 
as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, literally meaning as they worshiped the Lord and fasted. They were seeking Christ primarily for intimacy with him and for conformity to him. Later on, they'll fast and pray about direction from him and power from him for this work. But even this fasting and praying had nothing to do with strategic planning for the future, but was more simply prayerful dedication to the Lord. I just returned this, this, uh, this early last week uh, from a pastor's conference in, in northern uh, Oregon, uh, where uh, I was able to bring our youth pastor, Will, with me, and we're just really blessed to join together with a bunch of other Calvary guys from Idaho and Washington and Oregon uh, for a little pastor's conference, and I had the privilege of sharing one of the sessions there. And I taught pastors on spiritual disciplines, and I said, guys, uh, I mean, like, spiritual disciplines are to be practiced rightly, and if, if, I, if any group of Christians... Pastors, we, we probably lay in the most danger of practicing the, the spiritual disciplines for wrong reasons. I mean, uh, spiritual disciplines, we know those things that we do, like Bible reading, prayer, worship, fasting, all of these things, uh, you know, spiritual disciplines are things we do, not things that we are. They're an end to a means. Uh, they're not a means. Uh, they're, I'm sorry, they're a means to an end. Not an end in themselves. It's not like, hey, I read the Bible, check. Like, that's the end in itself. No, it's a means to an end. And I'm like, we're in danger of doing that. We get paid to practice the, the spiritual disciplines, to pray and, and all of this. But as pastors, I just encouraged our guys, myself included, that the primary purpose of, of worship, Bible study, fasting, is for a greater intimacy with the Lord and a greater and conformity to Him. Whether He ever calls us is up to Him. Are you more passionate about, passionate about what the Lord will do in you or what the Lord will do through you? I should probably say that the other way. More passionate about what the Lord will do through you or more passionate about what He'll do in you? And we all need to remain there. And I believe that these men that were called, they were called when they were faithful in the small things and when they were dedicated and devoted to the Lord in, in a worshipful state, fasting, going without food, dependent upon him, worshiping, spending time in his presence. And is not all of this uh, also... Uh, is not all of this evidenced in the Old and New Testaments? We remember that for Isaiah, it was after he saw the Lord high and lifted up. It was after uh, he said, woe is me, I'm undone, a man of unclean lips. It was after his iniquity was taken away and his sin was purged that he heard the voice, who shall I send, who will go for us? And then he said, here I am, send me. It was after John was, was in the spirit on the Lord's day on the island of Patmos. It was after he saw the, the vision of the Son of Man whose eyes were like a flame of fire. It was after he fell at his feet as dead that he received the call to write the apocalypse. And so it shall be with all of us. We ought to seek the Lord first. When were they called? Not when they were worrying, but when they were worshiping. Not when they were fretting, but when they were fasting. Not when they were strategizing, but when they were simply sitting at the feet of the Savior. Now, certainly all worship and no work produces a, an appearance of godliness and denying its power. But certainly, all work with no worship leads us into very treacherous places. And primarily, it brings me to my next point, the what. What were they called to? Well, they were called to the Lord's work. And if it's, if it's our own worry and our own plan that propels us into ministry, we'll be doing our work. But if it's simply worship, 
devotion to the Lord, then, we, then he will call us and send us to his work. And so what did they do? Notice there in verse 2, as they ministered or worshiped the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, now, <laughs> separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, having fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and sent them away. And so we're going to look at this first story that that happens after it. But first, I want to point out to you two things, our next two, and then we'll finish with the why. Our next two things is the what and the how. And they're, they're really found interchangeably here. The what was the Lord's work. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me. Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I've called them. They were going to go do the Lord's work. And we'll see in this, this initial story on the island of Cyprus, they do it in the Lord's way. Then, verse 3, it says, Then having fasted and prayed, now they do fast and pray for direction, empowered ministry, make sure it's the Lord's will. They laid hands on them and sent them away. And so this is the how of it. They went out by the Holy Spirit. So what did they do? The Lord's work. How did they do it? By the Holy Spirit. Uh, The Holy Spirit's all over this text. The Holy Spirit said through some prophetic utterance, separate to me Barnabas and Saul to the work that I've called them. Then they lay hands on them, anointing them with oil, much like we, uh, the the oil's not mentioned here, but much like we did in anointing Joshua with oil this morning as a representation of the Holy Spirit. Uh, We we see that they went forth. And then even verse four, it says, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, They went down to Seleucia, that's the coastal town, and from there they sailed to the to Cyprus. And that's their first journey, the first country where they land, the island country. And then it tells us, and when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues. They also had John as their assistant. Um, And so uh, we see the first thing they do in verse 5 is the Lord's work by, by going where? To the synagogue. They did the Lord's work the Lord's way. The Lord has a heart to the Jews first and then also to the Greek. They would always land at the synagogue. When I was on my who list, um, I can't remember if I mentioned much about John here. Uh, I think I did first service. I should have mentioned him earlier. They had John as their assistant. This is John Mark, um, the author of the, the gospel, Mark. Uh, he was brought back with them from, from uh, Jerusalem, uh, where he was. The, the disciples had been praying at his house during Peter's release. This is probably the young man that was wearing that white linen garment uh, that, uh, that when Jesus was arrested, left it and fled. Anyway, there'll be much discussion about John Mark later. As the going gets, gets tough, he gets going and, and uh, the, the wrong direction. And uh, then on the second missionary journey, Barnabas and, and Paul split over him. But John also was there, just a young man that loved uh, the Lord and, and uh, served, served the Lord, always wanted to be around the work of the Lord. And if I already said that earlier, I'm sorry. I can't recall if I did or not. Anyway, so uh, here they are doing the work of the Lord uh, and they're doing it the Lord's. They're doing it the Lord's way. And let's consider uh, the power of the Holy Spirit that is upon them. They've been sent out by the Holy Spirit. And then notice in verse six, it says, "Now when they had gone through the island of Paphos, they've uh, they've gone all the way through the island at this point, from the northeast corner all the way to the western side. Paphos is on the other side, and not a lot of mention is be- not a lot mentioned in between there. Although I'm sure much happened. Uh, then they find a certain sorcerer." A false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus. So this is a sorcerer. He's a Jewish man. Uh, His name literally means son of Joshua. Uh, This apple fell quite far from the tree that took his name. Joshua means the Lord saves. And here he's a a sorcerer. Uh, And he was with this Roman governor called the proconsul. Uh, His name Sergius Paulus, who was an intelligent man. So now Sergius Paulus... Uh, called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. So can you, can you picture it? Uh, the, the journey's begun. They're on the western side of the island. Uh, there's two men, one a Roman governor who says, hey, I want to hear the gospel. So he calls for Barnabas and, and Saul. Uh, and, uh, and then, verse 8, uh, 
the sorcerer, Bar-Jesus, his name is actually translated Elemus there in verse 8, but Elemus, the sorcerer, if that's how his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Uh, one quick note, when you do the Lord's work, it doesn't mean it's going to be uh, easy sledding, uh, and, and sometimes it's pretty difficult, uh, and the Lord's work will always be rejected. But because they're not just doing the Lord's work, but, but they're, how they're doing it is by the Spirit. We see them win this victory here. Then without any kind of narrative of why, then it says, then Saul, who is called Paul, and from this moment on, he'll be called Paul, and his name will be mentioned before Barnabas' name. It'll be Paul and Barnabas from here on out, except uh, one occasion later in the book of Acts. Uh, they, he looked intently at him, and uh, he said, uh, then Paul, filled, notice this is a very important phrase there in verse 9, filled with the Holy Spirit. Again, how is he doing this? By the Spirit. Looked intently at him, at, at this uh, sorcerer who's trying to resist the gospel going forth. And he says, oh, full of all deceit and all fraud. You're not a son of Jesus, like you're a son of the devil. Uh, you enemy of all righteousness. Uh, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking somebody to lead him by the hand. I'm so thankful for that little phrase that said, Saul, filled with the Holy, Saul who is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit said, because otherwise you would, I'd say the same thing you just said, that doesn't sound very Christian of you, <laughs> Paul. Like, how many of you have been sharing the gospel and just kind of blurted out, you son of the devil, enemy of all righteousness, when will you stop perverting the straight ways of the Lord? I'm going to strike you with blindness. You're not going to see the sun for a time. And you know, people are like, can we share with more grace and tact than that? You know? But this was Saul filled with the Holy Spirit, resisting this man who is resisting the gospel just like the devil who desires to deceive and twist the gospel and withstand it, so was this man. And Paul resisted him. But can we think for a second how Paul got saved? What did the Lord use in Paul's life for his conversion? He was what? Struck with blindness. And then the scales fell off and he came to faith in Christ. In fact, the best thing that ever happened to Saul of Tarsus is that he heard a solid word from the Lord, got knocked down and struck with blindness. And so in him cursing this man with blindness, it wasn't so much punitive as redemptive. In fact, Paul was passing along the very same gift that he received hoping that it would have the same redemptive end in this sorcerer's life as it did in his life. It's those of us uh, that have had to get knocked down where that pray, Lord, whatever it takes to bring my friend to know you. Those of us who had to come to the end of ourselves pray, Lord, bring them to the end of themselves. It was the very gift of grace you used in my life. And so what we find is here's the, the what and the how, and they did the Lord's work, and they did it in His strength, and how desperately we need both of those. And we conclude here now uh, in verse 12 with the why. And oftentimes that's the most important question, isn't it? The why. Then the proconsul believed. When he saw what the Lord had done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. And so why did the Lord send these men out? It's very clear there in verse 12. So that others might believe. So that the gospel might go forth to others, to those that don't believe. The Lord is sending forth those that are worshiping and sitting at his feet to go to those that don't believe. I love how this man believed. It says the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done and then being astonished, not at what had been done, but being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. So they both made an impact in his life. The gospel message and the striking of this man blind, they were both pretty impressive to him. But which one does it say he was more astonished at? The teaching of the Lord. I love that. Yes, the Lord used signs and wonders to, to accompany his word, 
But more, more powerful of the two, the word, the gospel message. More astonishing, the free gift of grace that this Roman general could receive, this Roman governor, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. And so that is the why. John Piper said, missions exist because worship doesn't. Because people all around the world, in Turkey, sadly today, and throughout the 1040 window, so many are caught up worshiping other gods. And so missions exist. God sends men out because worship doesn't. Because the Lord loves people, it is not desirous that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so he sends forth those so that we would win others to him, and that he would gather his elect from the four winds of the earth, his people, and that he would be glorified as we come to him. And that is the why for the gospel message, for the sake of God's glory. And that is the why. What about the five W's and an H for Jesus? Who was he? The son of God. When did he come? And the the time that the Lord purposed for him. But what was he doing? Faithful in the small things, 30 years of just faithful living. And then out in the wilderness, worshiping the Lord, dedicated to him before his ministry began. Uh, Where? The poor town of Nazareth. How did he go forth? In the power of the Holy Spirit. What did he do? the will of his father, and why did he do it? For his love for you and I. He said, if I am lifted up, I will draw all peoples to myself. Lifted up on the cross, but lifted up in our worship. And I would put forth to you today, Christian, that your primary goal is worship. To draw near to the Lord for intimacy with him for conformity to him. And it will be from there that he will call you into his purpose for your life. John Piper said, missions exists because worship doesn't. I could maybe add to that. Missions doesn't exist because worship doesn't in our hearts. There's so many times we're not on mission. Because we're not in worship. And uh, that's your first priority. Finally, 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 this verse, and then I'm done. We'll pray. Mark 3, 13 and 14. It's two verses. I'll sneak the second one in. I love it. I love it. Jesus went up on a mountain. And he called to himself. Where did he call him? Where did he call him? To himself. Who did he call Those he himself wanted. Why? So that they might be with him. So that they might be with him. And then that he might send them out to preach. This is the calling of the 12. And so today the Lord's calling you because he wants you. And he wants you to be with him. And then that he might send you. But let's first things first. Jesus, thank you for your great love for us. You've called us first and foremost to be worshipers, to be those that are delighted in you. Certainly one day in your presence is better than a thousand elsewhere. You said, seek my face, and our hearts said, Lord, your face we will seek. Lord, blessed are those whom you choose and cause to approach you that we might dwell in your courts and so we come Lord by the blood of Jesus Christ who died for us and rose again to give us life where free forgiveness is found and where we delight in you our Savior our friend our Lord our closest companion here on earth and we simply praise you for who you are and for what you've done we worship you we devote our hearts and our lives to you And Lord, if from that place you you want to send us somewhere and to someone, so be it, Lord. But first we just seek you for you, to be with you. And Lord, if there's some here that have never come to you, would you beckon them right now by the power of your spirit, 
bring them to the end of themselves, to the foot of a blood-stained cross, where they receive forgiveness and grace, amazing and brand new life and fellowship with you, the only King, Lord of all lords, and King of all kings, and the greatest one in the universe that any heart could ever know. We love you, Jesus. We just want to be with you. And so, Lord, receive us as we come. We love you. And if you want to send us, that's second. That's your prerogative. But, Lord, first we just come. And we say, have your way in me. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen.